you. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm honored to be part of Equal Education's work. It's hard work, but it lies at the center of our country's future. I believe that. And your work, both in communities and through litigation, I think is crucial to whether we're going to succeed as a country. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story. Can I tell you a story to start? I'm going to tell you a story to start, and then I'm going to ask you what the story means, what you think it means, and then I'm going to ask two questions, and then we'll take it from there. The story is about Mr. Julius Malema, and it happened last year at the beginning of May, about a week before the election last year. You remember the election? Yes. And I was driving home, it was 10 o'clock at night, and the 702 News was on, and the newscaster at 10 o'clock at night is a man called Ian Crew, and he likes to end off the news with something sensational. And the last item on the news was Mr. Julius Malema was speaking in Polokwane today. And he said that President Jacob Zuma should consider himself lucky that he's not sitting on a street corner selling single cigarettes because that's what he should be doing. You're smiling, but you don't want to. <laughs> You're trying to hide your smile. Who else was trying to hide a smile? You were. You were. Who else was trying to hide a smile? You were? You weren't? What did you think? What did you think of what Mr. Malema said at the end of April, beginning of May last year about President Jacob Zuma? Well, I believe it was his own opinion. And I could do George? And what did you think of the fact that he could say it? For me, I don't see it as in breaking the law. Because maybe it's his wish for him, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So Any other views? For starters, it's very funny. I mean, the rest of us all held our laughter, but we really wanted to laugh. Because, um, so you also really wanted to laugh? Yes. Um, not to the fact that he's saying it to the president, irregardless of who he was saying it to. Even if he had said it to you as a constitutional court judge, it would still be funny in the context in which he was saying it. Thank you to both of you. Those are very, very helpful. Because you emphasize that he was acting within his entitlements in a constitutional state. And you bring the background to that. In and you explain why it, it is, because it's actually outrageous, ladies and gentlemen. I listened in my car on the way home, and I went, <sighs> that he could say that. And I was waiting to see the next day in Business Day or the Star, was Guido Mantash or Zizi Cordua going to lay a charge? Would the presidency respond? And what happened? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. nothing. Now, I want to tell a second story. Can I tell a second story? Yes. There were two ladies entering South Africa from Botswana. This has happened last month. It was told to me by someone who's on the Independent Communications uh, Authority of South Africa, who was present. And they were standing in a queue, and they looked up at the, president, at the picture of Sir Ian Karma. Do you know who Sir Ian Karma is? Who is he? Thank you, sir. And they looked at him and they nudged each other and they said, he looks like a san, and they giggled. And two men came out from behind the counter and they were arrested and they were taken away. We don't know what happened to them. The end of the story, the person who told me the story doesn't know. He just saw these two women giggling about how Sir Ian Kama, the president of Botswana, looks, and he saw that they were arrested by two men in plain clothes and taken away. Zambia, a singer has just been acquitted of insulting the president. So I want to get back to the points that you made, because they're important. I think that what Mr. Malema said is outrageous. He has a 35-year-old man in public life 
who is deliberately insulting and belittling the head of state. Not only is President Zuma a human being who's controversial, we all have views privately and perhaps publicly about his capacities, his qualities, his attributes, his capabilities, but he's also head of state. And the leader of a party in public life was able to say something completely outrageous about him. And what is remarkable about it, ladies and gentlemen, is as you said, there was no reaction, as Barbara said. And that contrasts us with two-thirds of the entire world. Russia, you get arrested. China, you get arrested and put into jail. The rest of Africa, the Sutu, Swaziland, who knows what, what, who Podemo is? Podemo? Are you from Swaziland, ma'am? No. Sorry, but you know who Podemo is. Thank you. Oh, it's, um, it's what's supposed to be a liberation movement, basically. They're trying to fight the monarch in Swaziland. It's a movement for democracy. Two people are in custody at the moment, their case is currently before the court, simply for saying that there should be democracy in Swaziland. If you get up at a public meeting and say there should be democracy in Swaziland, you're arrested. And these two gentlemen have been in jail for over a year. Zimbabwe. I want to make an important point, which is that what Mr. Malema said was an illustration of what we have achieved on one side of the constitutional scale. And that scale is the scale that you've mentioned, which is freedom of speech, freedom to belittle, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief. It is quite extraordinary what we've achieved. We've got a vibrant and open democracy. And Mr. Malema is able to say what, exactly what he likes about President Zuma. And though I thought it was outrageous, my heart sang because I thought I'm living in a democracy where the big man, and President Zuma is the big man, and in our continent and in our world, we've had too many big men. And it's an important part of democracy to be able to do what you've said, express your view. And you shrugged your shoulders. You didn't think it was funny. You didn't think it was good or bad. It was his view. And that's how it should be. But that's only in one corner of our democracy. We have achieved extraordinary things in regard to media freedom, in regard to freedom of speech, conscience, belief. But the area where we have not achieved as much has been what Rob will tell you are called the material conditions of life. And now I want to ask those two questions. Carry on with the interactive session. I want to ask, what are the two most important questions about our lives? It's a bit widely spoken. You can address it as ever you like. What do you think are the most important issues that we have as human beings? Rise for human values. Sorry? Rise for human values. Yes, yes. Yes, that's, that's a good answer. So you say that... Injustice is the most important issue. Thank you. That's very nice. Anyone else, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, ma'am. Poverty. Sorry? Poverty. Poverty. Also a matter of justice, social justice. <coughs> and giving free speech doesn't give you social justice. That's the point that you're making. Yes, sir. Family, love. Sorry? Family yes. And love. Yes. Yes. That's lovely. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. No, that's, that's important. Because you're saying we are human beings with a need for engagement and for attachment and for dependency and for the beauty of human connection. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Unemployment. Yeah. Also a matter of social justice. Yeah. That's right. Yes. I would say a realization of our rights. Yeah, realization of our rights. You see, what our constitution does is that it recognizes that for Mr. Malema to be able to stand up at Polokwane 
and insult President Zuma, he's got to have a full stomach. He's got to have mobility. He's got to have the material conditions of your life determine whether you are able to exercise what we call first order rights, the freedom to move, the freedom to choose, the freedom to believe, the freedom to express your views, the freedom to hold views, the freedom to, to have a religion. You can't do all of those things if you are hungry and cold and if you don't have a house. And our constitution recognizes that. So it says that we have to achieve social and economic rights as well. Those issues of justice that all of you have raised. And I think that the two biggest questions for us, I agree with everything that all of you have said. The way I see it is that the two biggest questions for us are what I call the question of agency and the question of possibility. Question of agency is the answer to the question, what can I do? What are my capabilities? What, what, are, what, what am I able to do? What can I do in this world? And the question of possibility is the question of what does the world allow me to do? What are the limits and the possibilities that the world out there creates for all of us? And of course, as Rob would have told you yesterday, the two are interconnected. It was Karl Marx who realized that the world out there determines your ideological framework, the way you see the world, the belief system that you espouse. Your consciousness determines, is determined by your material conditions. So the two are linked. But I think for us, for me as a judge, for you as activists, those are the two most important questions. What can you do? What can we as South Africans do? And what does the world out there make possible for us to do? And the biggest thing out there in that world, I think, is the Constitution for us. Joey was just saying, where are you, Joey? Yeah, printing a Joey's printing a boarding pass. It's <laughs> very good of him. Michael, you should have gone and done that. Ladies and gentlemen, with regard to the first question, agency, we are a unique country. The fact that Mr. Malema can stand up like that and exercise his rights of free speech didn't come from 1994. It didn't even come from 1912. What happened in 1912? Thank you, ma'am. I just don't want you to get too comfortable. Okay? It didn't even happen in 1912. It preceded the formation of the ANC. We have had a people and a country who have successfully fought a very powerful state which was imposing a radically unjust system. We have to see the continuity of our history. We have people for whom the Constitution gives a sense of agency because our people were skeptical of power before the Constitution. Your parents, in, 19, in the 1980s, who started the United Democratic Front, all across the country, in townships and suburbs and cities and organizations and institutions, our people gained a deep skepticism about power. So when people say to me, is the Constitution strong enough to prevent a dictatorship? I say, no, it isn't. But our people are. And Mr. Malema, I don't endorse what he said about President Zuma. I don't endorse anyone insulting the president. But what Mr. Malema was doing was to draw on a long history of skepticism about power and about powerful figures. And that sense of agency, each of us asks, what can I do? And we in South Africa are specially empowered there. It's very tempting at this stage in our country to feel cynical or angry or passive or powerless, but we're not. We're not. Our history shows that we're not. Our history of resistance to white supremacy, to apartheid, to apartheid's injustice, to racial 
hierarchy and subordination. And then our history over the last 21 years shows that subjectively, we as South Africans have a great capacity for self-empowerment, for, for agency. And then the second question, the question of possibility, the question of the world out there. What does the world allow us to do? We've got an extraordinary constitution. It isn't working yet, but that's why when I started, I paid tribute to what you're doing, because what you're doing is the only thing that can make the constitution work. Civil society actors, together with government, together with legislators, together with political parties, but indispensably vital civil society actors are necessary to make this constitutional scheme work. And the tools it offers us are very considerable. I want to mention a few cases which illustrate what can and what can't be done. And then I'd like your views about them. Because I'd be interested to hear your views. The first case I want to mention is a very personal case to me because it concerns AIDS. And I'm living with HIV. I'm on antiretrovirals. I've been on antiretrovirals for a long time. How long do you think I've been on ARVs? 15 years. How long? More than 15 years. Which like an EP there. <laughs> yeah, quite right. I've been on antiretrovirals for 17 years, ladies and gentlemen. I was very sick with AIDS in 1997. And then I started ARVs. And I lead a full and healthy life. But I started off on ARVs because I was a judge and because I could afford to spend in 1997 4,200 Rand a month buying my own ARVs. And just after that, Zaki Ahmad in the city founded the Treatment Action Campaign. And the idea of the Treatment Action Campaign was to tackle the drug companies, to say, it is outrageous that there should be medical technology and production methods that can produce drugs cheaply that will save people's lives, but that people should be allowed to suffer, suffer terribly. How many of you know someone who's living with HIV? Almost everyone. How many know someone who died of AIDS? Almost everyone. Anyone here know someone who's sick right now with AIDS? You do too, Yanda? Yeah. So the Treatment Action Campaign tackled the question of drug pricing and it won that battle. The drugs I'm taking now, I'm taking Truvada, I'm taking Navarapine. They cost about $60 a year now. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. 600 rand a year, what's that, 50 rand a month, less than two rand a day. Quite extraordinary. The battle of drug pricing was won, and it was won because of activists like yourself, because people saw a world. You started us, sir. What is your name, please? Luyor. Sorry? Luyor. Luyor Law. Yes. Thank you, Luyor Law. Am I saying it right? Yes. You must help me if I'm not. They saw a world in which they felt they had agency. And they saw a world in which there was possibility for them to change it. Those two questions. What can I do? What opportunities does the world offer me? Those are the two questions that we have to ask ourselves every day in relation to the issues of injustice that press upon us all. And the Treatment Action Campaign won that battle of drug pricing, but the biggest nightmare while they were winning that battle was presidential denialism. It was a nightmare. Barbara was in Parliament. And President Mbeki refused to accept the science of AIDS. He refused to believe that it was a sexually transmitted epidemic. He refused to believe that the only mass epidemic of heterosexual AIDS anywhere in the world was in Africa. And he said, you racist. You're telling us that we as black people are having sex 
differently from everywhere else in the world. You're telling us that we're having sex with gay abandon. That was said in the document that he probably authored. It was a terrible moment, ladies and gentlemen. It was terrible because in forsaking science and forsaking reason and in forsaking evidence, he ignored the biggest fact about the AIDS epidemic in Africa. What's the biggest fact about the AIDS epidemic in Africa, the demography, the epidemiology of AIDS? Anyone tell me? Anyone here from... Yes, sir. Did you want to say something? AIDS started in Africa. Yeah, it started in Africa. Inter interestingly, President Mbeki wrote a letter to Mr. Tony Leon, who was then the leader of the Democratic Alliance, and he said it is an insult to say that AIDS came from Africa. Why would it be an insult to say that a virus comes from anywhere in the world unless you believe it is a shame a disgrace to have that virus. President Mbeki re-stigmatized AIDS terribly, just when we were trying. But that's, that's one fact. What, what's the other big fact about the epidemiology of AIDS? Where do you find AIDS in Africa? Let, let's challenge you. Do we find it everywhere in Africa? Do we find them? You're right. But do we find a mass epidemic everywhere in Africa? Did you say, was it Yanda? Where's the mass epidemic of Af in Africa? Central and Southern Africa. The Bantu-speaking peoples of Central and Southern Africa. There's no mass epidemic in West Africa. The biggest, the highest national prevalence in West Africa is 3.8%. Never, ever, ever these prevalences of 15, 18, 28, 38 percent at one stage. Mothers reporting for antenatal clinics in Swaziland and Botswana, 38 percent. Unimaginable prevalences. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not about black people. If it were, there'd be an epidemic in West Africa. It's not about the way people have sex. I don't think there's anything distinctive about the way people in Central and Southern Africa have sex. I believe it's environmental and probably genetic. And there's evidence emerging for the first time that there is some susceptibility. There was evidence presented just two weeks ago for the first time that there's some biological vulnerability to people in, in Southern Africa. I only mention that because it shows the catastrophe of a president who was impelled by his own sense of shame about black people, his own internalized feelings about sex and about blackness. And then he abandoned reason and he abandoned evidence and it was a catastrophe for us. But agency and possibility, treatment action campaign, Kasatu at the time, Zwilanzima Vavi at the time. Anyone know who Zwilanzima Vavi is? He was the staunchest ally of the Treatment Action Campaign. South African Council of Churches. None of the businesses, none of the other organizations, but the churches and the unions stood with the Treatment Action Campaign, and they went to court. And they went to court with two very important rights. The one was the right to health care. It's not a first-order right. It's not about speaking your mind or having something in your head, or being free to move. It's about medicine and doctors and hospitals and help. And the Constitution says that government shall take reasonable legislative and other measures to realize the right of access to health care. And the Treatment Action Campaign was going to enforce that right. And they exercised another important right, Section 34, which says that everyone has the right of access to courts to have a matter that can be adjudicated by law heard in a court. And they said, we're going to exercise those two rights. But they did a very important thing. Everything I'm trying to say right now feeds into our discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Before they got there, they exercised all the other rights, movement, association, marches, slogans, posters, 
CEOs, ministers of health, deputy ministers of health, before Barbara became minister of health. Posters, marches, statements. One of the best informed movements anywhere in the world was the Treatment Action Campaign. And they conscientized people. They had treatment literacy campaigns so that people, ordinary people, knew what the issue was. Ordinary people who, like you, you said that you know someone who's very unwell at the moment. At that time, there was no person in our country who didn't know someone who was dying of AIDS because 500,000 people a year were dying of AIDS. And the Treatment Action Campaign prepared the ground for its litigation. It didn't just pick an issue and say, bring in the lawyers. It saw that the legal struggle is one component of a larger struggle. And the struggle is about justice. And the law is just one way, one small way, I believe. I'm a judge. I'm honored to serve in the Constitutional Court. But I have a modest view of what we can do. But the TAC showed what, with the right preparation, the right activism, the right public support, the right alliance building, and the right issues, what can be achieved. And it was a momentous day because President Mbeki said these drugs are toxic. I watched and I knew that my life had been saved. Within two weeks of starting on ARVs, ladies and gentlemen, I knew that my life had been saved. And I couldn't keep quiet because I knew it was a terrible, terrible thing. Terrible thing that he was doing. <coughs> and the Treatment Action Campaign took a case after they'd done everything they possibly could to persuade government. They took a case to court and they chose an issue which was mothers, mother to child transmission. At that stage, the medical science was completely clear. With one particular drug, the drug I'm taking every day, I've been taking it every day for 15 years, nevirapine, you cut the risk in half. You give the mum one tablet of nevirapine, you give the baby after it's born half a teaspoon of nevirapine, cut it in half. With Longer term therapy, you cut it out even more highly. And if you put the mum on antiretroviral therapy, you cut out the chances altogether. I can't transmit HIV. It's not anywhere to be found in my saliva, my semen, my blood, nowhere. So that's the most effective way of stopping transmission of HIV. And they took all of this to court. And the Pretoria High Court ruled that government's measures on AIDS were not reasonable. And the government continued to fight. Toxic. Unsure. We don't know. Maybe it's going to be bad. Finances. We haven't got the money. Government raised all those issues. And the Constitutional Court, in what I think is its most important judgment in 21 years, ruled that President Mbeki had to start making antiretroviral treatment available. It was momentous because this wasn't a road or one school. It wasn't a, a vanity project for the president. This was a central plank of his conception of Africanhood, of blackness, and of his power. His project was the African Renaissance. And here the court was saying to him, You've got to start making ARVs available. And there was a terrible period of uncertainty whether President Mbeki would follow the judgment. He was very reluctant to, but he did in the end. And two and a half years after the court judgment, government committed itself to a national antiretroviral treatment program. And today, we've got the world's Biggest publicly provided ARV treatment program. You know how many people are on it? Who knows? Anyone? Three million. 
We've just been complimented by UNAIDS and the World Health Organization for what we've achieved. It's not enough, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Just, let's just put to one side, we still have around about 200,000 people, 15,000 people every month are still dying of AIDS. We've still got new infections. More people are getting infected with HIV than are getting onto treatment. So we've still got an AIDS crisis. It's a much, much, much smaller crisis, and we know what to do, but we've just got to do more of it. And stigma is still the biggest problem, I think, with prevention, with treatment, with access, with testing, with all those things. So the TAC showed what can be done, and to President Mbeki's credit, when the history books are written about President Mbeki, on the credit side will be the fact that he bowed his head before the law. And that's important because of the debate that we've seen over the last three weeks with whom? Well, president. From Sudan. Uh, yeah. Is it the discussion about the judiciary? Yes, exactly. And the, the, the issue before that, which was President Omar al-Bashir from oh, Sudan. Yeah. And the question whether there was an order <laughs> by the court that he shouldn't leave. So, ladies and gentlemen... The Treatment Action Campaign case shows us the conjunction of agency and possibility. It shows us what people who believe in their own capacity to make an impact on the world can do when they look at the world and see what the world allows them to do. And that's what I think. I don't know much about you or about your organization, which is why I'm trying to get a discussion going so that you can give your views as well. But that's what I think you're doing. And I want to, in the rest of my talk, I want to talk about some failures, and then I want to end with a success in the courts. And I, was, I wasn't on the Constitutional Court when it decided the Treatment Action Campaign case. I was in Bloemfontein. I was watching with my hot in my mouth until the court's judgment came out. And I was very proud to be a South African, to be a lawyer, and to be a judge when the judgment came out. But there are other cases, and I want to discuss three cases with you. And the first case is about toilets. Who grew up without adequate sanitation? Yanda, who else? You did, sir? Informal settlement or rural area? Informal settlement here in Cape Town. Yeah. Which one? Um, Cambridge. Okay. And you? Same. Um, informal settlement, Kailicha, Munwabisi Park. Okay. Munwabisi Park. And where was the nearest toilet? Um, it was about 10 minutes away. Um, it was not even a toilet, it was a bush. Yeah. So you just had to defecate and urinate in the bush? Yeah. Okay. And you, sir? Okay. Was it a toilet? Yeah, like um, not a flush toilet. Okay. Like a um, machine, not a machine toilet. Yeah. Toilet, yeah. Okay. But it had it had running water. No. Okay. It was a pit. Yeah. Okay. This this case was brought by a group of people who were led by a, a community leader called Mr. Nokotiana, and they were from the Harry Gwala informal settlement outside Benoni which is about 40 kilometers east of Johannesburg. And they'd been waiting for an upgrade. They were told that they were going to get an upgrade, and years passed, years and years and years and years and years passed, and nothing happened. And the case came to us, and it's very important to know what happened. Their, their case before us was they said, we want you to order the Kuruleni Metro and the Gauteng Provincial Government to give us what are called ventilated improved pit latrines, VIP toilets. It's a nice name. Yeah. You're, the you're the sound man, you're allowed to laugh. <laughs> did you laugh about President Zuma? I did. Did you? I didn't see, otherwise I'd have asked you. 
VIP toilets, ladies and gentlemen, which, which are built with bricks. They pits like you like you had. What is your name, sir? Um, Pardon? Sin. 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 Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Nice to meet you. They also were pit latrines, but they were built with bricks. And government said to us, we cannot give the Harry Gwala 500 households. And some households maybe have seven, eight, nine people in them. You can imagine how many people. These were thousands of people in one settlement. They said we cannot give them VIP toilets because we have to decide whether we're going to do an in-situ upgrade or whether we're going to relocate them. They, this settlement is due for upgrading, but we don't know yet how to do it. And ladies and gentlemen, the point about the case is the one I'm going to make now. The evidence before us showed that Ekuruleni had approved the upgrade of the Harigwala settlement, but they needed funds from Gauteng. And once they'd got approval and funds from Gauteng, they could make the decision whether to do an in-situ upgrade or whether to relocate. And for three years, three years, Gauteng had done nothing. And there were two people, I will never forget their names, to whom Ekuruleni, there was a planning department in, in Benoni, which became part of the Ekuruleni municipality. And the people, the architects and the urban designers in the Ekuruleni planning department kept on writing emails to two people, Mr. Fulamon Mudal and his boss, Ms. Nomsa Esten Gubeni. I'll never forget their names. Ms. Nomsa Esten Gubeni appeared in our court again on the papers. I don't know who she is. I want to meet her one day. I want to meet Ms. Nomsa Esten Gubeni. I want to know what her life is like, what car she drives, what her salary is, what she does. I would really be interested because I don't, I don't know her life and I, will, I want to be respectful of her, not disrespectful. She said... I saw the emails, but I thought Mr. Mudal was dealing with them. He's my junior. Mr. Mudal didn't give us an explanation. And that point is a point about what the world offers to us. What possibilities and impediments, opportunities and impediments the world offers to us. Because lack of constitutionalism isn't always presidential denialism, high doctrine, <coughs> high policy. Lack of constitutionalism more often are these mundane things with incompetent... Barbara, why are you agreeing so much? I'd love to hear. Um, having sat in a ministry just after Manto. And just been exposed to the multitude of problems in the, in, the, in the health system. That when you look at it objectively, these should not be problems. You know, the, oh, the problem that we still got about uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, with drugs being uh, shortages of drugs. Stockouts. Stockouts. You know, it, it's just, that's not a policy decision. That's not a failure of the Constitution, or you know, a mistake that we made with the Constitution. It's not a policy problem. And what we uncover is that it's corruption. The way that the whole drug distribution system operates is deeply corrupted. So uh, you know, so many of these issues is around the quality of a service, and and the and the values that people bring when they have the responsibility to to be of service to their communities. I want to make one qualification of what Barbara said. Corruption is a massive problem. I think our three biggest problems in, in the country, if you ask me, inequality, lack of justice. Who said inequality just now? Was you, man. Crime and corruption. Cor corruption is a massive problem, but often it's not even corruption. It's incompetence. It's, it's simple incompetence. People. 
I want to know what Ms. Nomsa Esten Gubeni's salary is because I want to know what she's doing to earn it. That she can, as a supervisor of Mr. Mudar, she can receive an email, repeated emails, over a period of years and not be responsive to them. Now, what does that say for activism, that we are dealing with a complex, difficult, often unresponsive, sometimes slothful, I don't know if that was Ms. Ngubeni's problem, state bureaucracy. It says that we've got to aim some of our activism at ways of activating this state bureaucracy in ways that will work for ordinary people. Now again I'm saying the judiciary can only do part of it. Our order is often criticized in Nokotiana. We said no. We're not going to order them to national government and the province said we cannot roll out VIP toilets everywhere in Gauteng and we cannot roll them out everywhere nationally. We have to first decide whether people are going to be upgraded in situ. Then we can build VIP patrons. But we can't do it. And we said we accept that. It's not unreasonable. And we, d we didn't give the applicants any relief. The only order we gave was we said we want to hear from Gauteng within one year what has happened. And within one year that decision was in fact made and the Harry Gwala informal settlement was in fact upgraded. So a lot of people say that we failed as judges and I love it when they say that because I like to fight. I say we didn't fail. I say there were other failings and for us to go in and make a decision about what particular type of sanitation is not my job as a judge. So I always like that fight. Michael, what do you think? I agree. You really agree? I agree. Okay. Michael was my law clerk. You know what a law clerk is, ladies and gentlemen? It's the cleverest, hardest working young lawyers from the universities. And they come and they spend a year with you. And they bring their energy and their idealism and their brilliance. And they help you do your, judges, your, do, your job as a judge. And Michael was my law clerk for a year. So I'm very proud of him. Michael agrees, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you another example. The water case. Madzibuko versus city of Johannesburg. And this was an even more controversial decision that we gave in the Constitutional Court. And I was there again. And the water case was about the minimum daily allowance of water. And there was a prescribed minimum in the regulations under the Water Act. There were a number of issues in the case. The one was the minimum daily per allowance per person. And the other was the question of water meters in Piri. And the city of Johannesburg told us that Piri is one of the oldest. Anyone here from Soweto? Are you mostly from Western and Eastern Cape? Are you from Soweto, man? Which part? Pimble. Pimble, okay. So Pimble's not far from Piri. Not that far. No. Um, Piri was the, one of the oldest parts of Soweto, and it was one of the first areas of Soweto that had reticulated water. And there were old pipes, and they were rusting, and they had to be replaced. And the city, the city council said, we want to install water meters. I want you to commit yourselves now. Prepaid water, good or bad? Put up your hands. Who says it's good? Mr. Soundman, you think it's good? Yes. <laughs> Anyone else agree with Mr. Soundman? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the city of Johannesburg said to us that we think the best way is to use water meters and to make people pay in advance because we understand that the people of Piri are poor. But there are 105,000 households in informal settlements who don't have running water at all. 700,000 people at that time in Johannesburg who don't have water at all. 
They said, we need to do the water meters. And the case was brought in 2006. And in 2007, there was a local government election. And everyone in Piri, everyone in Soweto, 88% of people voted for the existing government. And we were told that on the papers. So we were asked, in the face of this evidence of the functioning of democracy, in the face of the evidence from the government agency that had to determine how, <coughs> the city said to us, ladies and gentlemen, if you are a poor person, we have an indigency policy, you can come to us. We'll give you as much water as you need and you won't have to pay for it. But you've got to come and register. They said that's humiliating. We said, it's not for us to determine. That's what government says. You must register if you want more than the minimum daily allowance for people. The second thing, ladies and gentlemen, can you see why this case was important? Can you see why the work is exciting but it's hard? The second thing was that the Social Justice Coalition, who were working in this case, they said, we've got to determine what the minimum daily water allowance should be for people. And we said, no, it's not our job as judges. We had experts. We had experts from Brazil, experts from Venezuela. We knew that the city of Johannesburg had done extensive research on what the minimum daily allowance per person should be. They put all the evidence before us and they said, this is what we have determined. The activists disagree with us, but this is what we're doing. And we said, that's your job. Now, what I'm going to say about this case, ladies and gentlemen, is as important as the point I was making about Nokotiana. Nokotiana is the VIP toilet. Madibuko is the water case. And that's the importance of electoral democracy. And the importance of the people who are... The point about Nokotiana was a slothful and inept bureaucracy. The point about Madzibuka, the water, is that it's in the power of people. And we, you cannot be a judiciary that is flying solo, especially on social and economic rights. You've got to be a judiciary that acts within a context of social agency, of political agency, and of administrative and executive agency with proper accounting of all those other spheres and agencies as well. So we often attack for Nokodiana, and I like it. Anyone want to attack me for, no for, for Madzibuko? Rob? No, I agree with you. Mike? You agree with me. Barbara? Yep. I reserve my judgment. Exactly. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you a question? Joey. How can you say, you say you, you've got to come and register, is that the, what the city is saying, you've got to come and register, but what's being proposed is to put in prepaid water meters. Mm -hmm. Now water is not, water is not like electricity, it's not a service that you need that improves things, that, that lets you run appliances and, and makes your life easier. Mm -hmm. Water is a basic requirement mm -hmm. for aspects of your dignity, to clean yourself, to cook for yourself, to drink. To drink. Uh, so could, could the, is to, it, is it to not... To water your vegetable patch. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So is it not within the, within the court's uh, ambit to say, on principle, the idea that you have to be able to have the money mm -hmm. before you can access uh, a basic right is, uh, is, is un it's, it's goes against the right to equality and, and dignity. Let me tell you what Joey is saying is very important. He's making the argument 
that the activists made before us. But the argument the city made was we agree with all of that. And if you can't pay, we won't make you pay. But come and tell us. And the difficulty that we have, the city said to us, is that we don't know how many people are in a household. The minimum daily allowance that we give free for everyone, Santon, Brixton, Killarney, Piri, Pimble, that's good enough for every household if there are 4.7 people per average in the household. But some households have 11 people or 15 if they're backyards. So you, we, we, we cannot do it. We cannot increase the minimum daily uh, uh, allowance for everyone because it would be ruinous. That's what the city said. And we said, we see the dilemma. It's hard. But everyone agrees that water shouldn't be negotiable. But the city says we will provide it for you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've now heard... Yes, ma'am. I think also is a way that to convey the message to the people because you said everyone who is poor should come, come yeah, forward. That's what, that's what the city said. And, and that's why people couldn't come forward yeah. because everyone is embarrassed. Exactly. No one, no one wanted to be seen as a poor person. So I think the way you... It was, that argument was before us. Ma'am, what is your name, please? Ndiswa. Sindiswa. Andiswa. thank you. What Andiswa was saying was actually before us. We were told that. We were told that this is wrong because it affects people's dignity. And we said that the dignity impairment is real, but that it's not strong enough for us to say to government, you've got to change this. Because government's job is to decide how to roll out water. It's not the court's job. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard all the arguments. You've now got to vote. <laughs> the last case, I'm going to ask you to vote before I tell you what we decided. Are you willing to do that? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you the case. I'll, give you, I'll tell you everything you need to know about the case. The city of Johannesburg has a housing policy. And the housing policy says that when we, the city, evict you because of safety or fire or because it's our building, we will give you emergency shelter if you don't have alternative accommodation. But when Andiswa evicts, She's a private person. We don't give emergency shelter. That was the question before us. Is it constitutional for a local authority to give emergency housing to evictees who are evicted by itself or from its own property? but not to give emergency shelter to evictees who are homeless, or everyone's homeless, if the landlord is a private person, if it's Freddie or Andiswa. What did we decide? Who says that the policy of the city of Johannesburg was unconstitutional? Put up your hands. One... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen out of twenty-seven people. Who says it was constitutional? One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I want to wrap up, ladies and gentlemen. The cases I've asked you to help me discuss. I've done so because they show that there are instances where the law can be used with spectacular success, but that the conditions require social mobilization, issue selection, and also plaintiff selection. That's, that's, that's a different subject, the whole question of how you select a public interest case. But Assuming that the right selection is made, 
enormous success can be achieved. And the TAC case shows that we live in a constitutional democracy. And the fact that we've got 3 million people, the biggest number of people on publicly provided AIDS treatment anywhere in the world, is an achievement of activism and courageous judges and the law and the constitution and the rule of law. I've also shown you the difficulties that realizing social and economic rights present. These are daily complex choices that bureaucrats have to make, that activists have to make. The issues in Nokodiana were difficult. The issues in Madzibuka were very difficult. And the problems attending them included bureaucratic ineptitude in simple issues of service delivery. And they also included in the Treatment Action Campaign case a terrible malignity of purpose of understanding and a rejection of science. And in the Madzibuko case, I selected it to show you how the limits of the court, what the court won't do, and what the court, in my view, shouldn't do. And in the last case, I selected it because it offers a very good example of where you can make rights talk even though rights talk has budgetary implications. Because the city council said to us, don't do this. Don't do this. We haven't got the money. We cannot provide emergency accommodation for everyone being evicted in the city. It's going to cost us too much. But we did rule that it was unconstitutional. Blue Moonlight says it is unconstitutional for a local authority not to provide private evictees with emergency accommodation. And the reason we disregarded the city's budgetary evidence was that it wasn't very strong. They just made the claim. They didn't give us details why it was impossible for them. They didn't say, this is what it will cost. This is our budgetary limits. It was unpersuasive evidence of budgetary constraints. So ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are after 21 years. It's hard. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. But you're at the forefront of it.